What's up? Let's go ahead and cover the male genital system. We will cover the most important aspect of the male genitals and hopefully in the end you will have a pretty good understanding about this topic. Alright, the male genital organs are divided into the internal genital organs and the external genital organs. We will cover both of these in detail and we will start with the internal genital organs. So the internal genital organs consist of the testes, epididymis, ductus deferens, seminal gland, ejaculatory duct, prostate, male urethra, and the bulbourethral glands. Alright, let's follow these arrangements starting with the testes. Now, of the whole male reproductive system, the primary functional cells the male has are Leydig and Sertoli cells, and both of them are found in the testes. So the testicle or testes is the male reproductive gland or gonad in all animals, not just human. Leydig cells produce testosterone, which is a steroid hormone that binds to intracellular receptors and regulates the protein synthesis. And what that does is that it influences the male development by uh, helping with maturation and development of muscles, deepening the voice, growing body hair, and promoting the production of red blood cells. Testosterone also stimulates the Sertoli cells to provide structural support and secrete fluid to nourish and support uh, developing sperm cells. So that means that testosterone is also essential to maintain spermatogenesis and male fertility. And in the absence of testosterone stimulation, spermatogenesis does not proceed. It doesn't happen, basically. The testes are located outside of the body, right? In a pouch called a scrotum. During prenatal development, they originate in a lumbar region near the kidneys, and then they descend through the retroperitoneal space and inguinal canal to reach the scrotum. As they descend, the layers of the abdominal wall form the layers of the scrotum as the testes pass through them. And here's also a fun fact. The testicular vessels descend together with the testes, and that is why the testicular arteries, or the gonadal arteries, come from the lumbar region of the abdominal as well. So, same goes for the female and the ovaries. And also, lymphatic drainage is similarly directed to the lumbar nodes. Okay, so we're first going to cover the testes external structures, then we will open it up and cover the internal structures. After that, we're going to talk a little bit about the ependymis and finally go through their coverings and the external fixation. Awesome, let's do the external structures first. Externally, the testes have an upper pole and a lower pole. It has an anterior border and a posterior border. And if you look at the testes from an anterior perspective, you will also see that it has a lateral surface and a medial surface. So the external features of the testes are very simple. Let's now go ahead and look at the internal structures of it. And we will start by removing all other structures we're not interested in for now. Now first off, we need to identify the most external layer, and that is a capsule called a tunica albuginea. Tunica albuginea is a dense membrane of connective tissue covering the testes, and if you remove the lateral wall of the testes, you will see that the tunica albuginea covers the external part of the testes. Right underneath the tunica albuginea, you will find the vascular layer, or tunica vasculosa containing primarily blood vessels. Within the actual testes, you will find septae, or septae of testes. They are connective tissue that separates the inner structures of the testes into lobules, called lobules of the testes. Now, the lobules of the testes are regions that contain single tubules, right? So each lobule has a single tubule. And each of these single tubules make up a convoluted semiferrous tubules, which are coiled, and once the tubules leave the lobule, it will become straight, so straight tubules. Now, what do these tubules look like underneath the microscope? Here you see lobules. They literally look like pyramids, separated by septae of connective tissue that extend inwards from the capsule, right? Semiferrous tubules have a convoluted part 
that is within the lobule itself and a straight part that uh, concentrates towards where all the lobules meet. These semiferrous tubules have Sertoli cells, which are large columnar cells, as you see here. These cells have a very tight junction between them that they form the blood testes barrier. This barrier prevents the sperm from entering the bloodstream, which also prevents the body's immune system from mounting an immune response against the sperm cells. So this barrier is very, very important. You can also see the process of spermatogenesis in this slide, which, remember, is the process by which the spermatogonia develops into sperm. You can see some sperm cells located in the lumen of the tubule. Leydig cells are also called interstitial cells, and they're called interstitial cells because they are found in the connective tissue, or interstitium, between the semiferrous tubules. Now, the Leydig cells are round cells, as you see here, with vesicular nuclei and very eosinophilic cytoplasm. Remember earlier I told you that the male reproductive system has two really important functional cells? One of them is the Sertoli cells, the other one is the Leydig cells. Leydig cells secrete testosterone, the male sex hormone. Alright, so that is the lobules and the septae of the testicles. More posteriorly, we have the mediastinum of the testes. The mediastinum of the testes has a network of tubules called rete testes. This network of tubules will give off efferent ductules, which continue into the ependymis, And this happens in the head of the ependymis, the upper part of it. So let's now go ahead and talk about the ependymis a little bit. Now, I want you to understand something about the ependymis. It's not really an organ of its own. It doesn't really have any functional cells. The ependymis is actually just tubes that are coiled together so tightly that they form a structure called the ependymis. Now, even though it doesn't really have any functional cells on its own, the ependymis does something really important for the testes, and that is that it serves as a reservoir for the spermatozoa. So, the sperm cells mature within the ependymis, and it's provided with nutrition by the ependymis, so that they gain the capacity to move and fertilize the ovum. In reality, spermatozoa spend 10 to 12 of their total 72 days of maturation within the ependymis. Awesome. Externally, the ependymis has a head, or caput, and, as I mentioned earlier, the cranial part of the head is formed by the efferent ductules that come from the mediastinum of the testes, right? Then we have the body of ependymis, which is formed by the convoluted duct of the ependymis. We got the tail of the ependymis, which connects to the ductus deferens. Another thing we can mention here is that anatomically, there's going to be a pouch located at the lateral surface between the testes and the ependymis. That pouch is called the sinus of the ependymis, and here's an anterior view, just to make it easier to visualize it. Alright, let's now go ahead and recap the ducts of the testes and the ependymis. First, we get convoluted semiferrous tubules within the lobules of the testes. Then, we got the straight tubules that form reta testes. They continue into the ependymis as the efferent ductules, Within the ependymis, we got the ducts of the ependymis, which continues as the ductus deferens. So that's really how the tubules are arranged. Let's now go ahead and look at the coverings and the external fixation of the testes and the ependymis. Alright, let's zoom in first. The layer that is closest to the testes and the ependymis is the tunica vaginalis. The tunica vaginalis is originally a part of the peritoneum that becomes uh, one of the layers of the scrotum during the descendants of the testes. And notice that the tunica vaginalis is composed of two layers with a little space between them. We've got the visceral layer covering the testes and the ependymis from an anterior and a lateral aspect. It fuses with the tunica albuginea and then posteriorly the visceral layer continues into the parietal layer. Between the visceral and the parietal layer, there's a little space which contains a small amount of serous fluid, just like the peritoneum does. And notice how the tunica vaginalis covers the whole thing as a pouch, except the posterior ends of the ependymis. And that is because the visceral layer envelops all, 
but the posterior aspect of the testis, while the parietal layer lies against the scrotal wall. Alright, remember I told you that the testes descend from the lumbar region in the retroperitoneal space, and as they descend, they take with them all the layers of the abdominal wall to form the scrotum. The inner layer comes from the peritoneum, called tunica vaginalis. Externally to that, there's the internal spermatic fascia, which is a continuation of the transversalis fascia of the abdominal wall. Then, externally to the internal spermatic fascia, we have a muscle called the cremaster muscle, which is a skeletal muscle that pulls the scrotum towards the abdominal wall. So, when it gets cold, these muscle fibers contract to pull the testes closer to the body, and if it gets hot, they relax. These muscle fibers, the cremaster muscle, consist of muscle bundles from the internal oblique and the transversus abdominis muscles, and it's covered by the cremasteric fascia. Externally to this muscle, we have the external spermatic fascia, which is a continuation of the superficial abdominal fascia. Now, just to complete the picture here, externally to this layer, we're going to have the dartos fascia, which is a layer of connective tissue found in the scrotum and the foreskin in males, and the vaginal lips in females. And then externally to that, we have the skin, and these are basically all the layers of the scrotum. But now, these layers, the external spermatic fascia, the cremaster muscle, and the internal spermatic fascia, they're going to continue upwards and form the spermatic cord, or funiculus spermaticus. And here you see a naked testicle covered by the tunica vaginalis. Externally to that, we can see the internal spermatic fascia. Externally to that, we can see the cremaster muscle. Externally to that, again, we can see the external spermatic fascia. And again, here we see the spermatic cord. So let's expose the spermatic cord a little. Let's cut the external spermatic fascia here. Let's cut the cremaster muscle here. Let's cut the internal spermatic fascia here. And let's cut through the anterior part of the tunica vaginalis and then look at the whole thing from this perspective. We'll see this. I know I'm repeating myself many times here, but I really want you to remember this. So here we see the external spermatic fascia, cremaster muscle, internal spermatic fascia, and down here we can see the tunica vaginalis. We can also see the testes and the ependymis. Alright, so up here we can see the inguinal canal, and down here we can see the scrotum, right? Between the inguinal canal and the scrotum, we can see the spermatic cord. So the spermatic cord is a tough, rope-like structure that goes from the scrotum to the inguinal canal. Within the spermatic cord, we can find the ductus deferens coming from the ependymis, but we can also find vessels. We can find the artery to the ductus deferens, which is a branch of the internal iliac artery that supplies the ductus deferens. We can find the testicular artery, which is a branch of the abdominal aorta, supplying the testes and the ependymis. We have the lymph vessels from the testes and the ependymis that flow uh, to the lumbar lymph nodes. We have the pampiniform plexus, which is a venous plexus conveying blood from the testes and the ependymis to the inferior vena cava on the right and to the left renal vein to the left. We got the testicular plexus, which is basically the uh, nervous plexus of the testes and the differential plexus, which are uh, visceral sensory nervous plexus of the ductus deferens. So that was everything I had regarding the spermatic cord and the testes and the ependymis as well. Let's now go ahead and talk a little bit about the ductus deferens. The ductus deferens is a tubular organ that transports spermatozoa from the ependymis to the prostatic urethra by peristaltic contractions, right? So it passes from the scrotum through the spermatic cord and the inguinal canal into the lesser pelvis where it crosses the urethra and enters the prostate. Alright, now the ductus deferens have different parts according to their location. If it's in the scrotum, it's called the scrotal part. After the scrotal part, it goes within the spermatic cord, called the funicular part. Then it enters the inguinal canal through the superficial inguinal ring, getting the name inguinal part. Then it leaves the inguinal canal through the deep inguinal ring 
and enters the pelvis, uh, called the pelvic part. The pelvic part of the ductus deferens is going to go through the lesser pelvis and pass anterior to the external iliac vessels, and it will run close to the urinary bladder and dilate to form the ampulla of the ductus deferens, which is the most distal segment of the ductus deferens. Then, ductus deferens will fuse with the duct of the seminal gland to form the ejaculatory duct, which will enter the prostate and join the urethra, the prostatic urethra at the semi seminal colliculus. Alright, that was all for the ductus deferens. Let's go through the next segment of the male genital system, which is this one, the seminal gland. The seminal gland is very, very important as well. The seminal glands are located behind the urinary bladder, above the prostates. Each seminal gland is a simple tubular gland composed of a single duct with multiple uh, convolutions. The seminal glands produce 50 to 80% of the ejaculate fluid, so it produces fluid that makes up uh, semen, which is released during ejaculation. So the seminal gland has an excretory duct, which joins the ductus deferens, as you see here, to form the ejaculatory duct that empties into the, into the urethra. Awesome. Let's now continue to the next segment and talk about the prostate. Now, the prostate is the largest male genital gland, and it produces roughly about 30% of the ejaculate fluid. It is located subperitoneally, so under the peritoneum, and also inferior to the urinary bladder. The urethra goes through the prostate along with the uh, paired ejaculatory ducts. Alright, externally there's a base called the base of the prostate, which is the broad uh, cranial part of the prostate located around the neck of the urinary bladder. We have an apex of the prostate, which is the tip of the prostate pointing towards the pelvic floor. There's the posterior surface facing the rectum, and an anterior surface facing the pubic symphysis. And then within the prostate, we have the urethra, or to be specific, the prostate part of the urethra. All right, let's zoom in a little bit. Now, the prostate is divided into zones, histological zones, not anatomical. But I want to mention them anyway, because the prostate is built differently across the inner surface of it. So the outer part of the prostate we got the peripheral zone. This zone is rich in glands that produce seminal fluid. Around the ejaculatory ducts and the prostatic utricle, there's the central zone. There's also a transitional zone around the proximal part of the urethra. The transitional zone is where benign prostatic hyperplasia occurs and can lead to bladder outlet obstruction when an adenoma grows to a significant size. Then, the rest is usually a non-glandular zone composed of fibromuscular stroma. Again, these are microscopic zones, so histological zones, not anatomical. Just keep in mind that the prostate has zones. Some parts have more glands, some parts have more ducts, and some parts have more muscles and fibers. Now, if we make a vertical cut like this, then look at the prostate from this perspective, we will see this. So, on the posterior surface of the prostate, we can see the prostatic ductules, which secretes the prostatic secretions. We can see the urethral crest, which is an elevated crest on the posterior surface of the urethra. There's an elevated area on the urethral crest called the seminal colliculus. And on the seminal colliculus, you can find the prostatic utricle, which is an unpaired remnant of the paramesonephric duct. And we can find the openings of the ejaculatory ducts uh, on both sides of the seminal colliculus for the sperma. So that was all I had for the prostate. Let's now do the bulbourethral glands. The bulbourethral glands are a pair of accessory genital glands. They lie closely above the bulb of the penis and empty their fluid into the beginning part of the sponges urethra. These pea-sized glands are located on the inferior surface of the deep transverse perineal muscles, and they produce a viscous liquid that lubricates the internal surface of the urethra during ejaculation. Awesome. Let's quickly go through the male urethra. Here we see the urinary bladder, the prostate, the perineal muscles, and the penis. The male urethra is here, going through all of these structures. 
So it goes from the internal urethral orifice in the uh, urinary bladder to the external urethral orifice and exiting the glans penis. Now, the urethra is divided into several parts based on the regions they are located in. In the prostate is called the prostatic urethra, in the perineum is called the membranous urethra, and in the penis it goes through the corpus spongiosum, so it's called the spongious urethra. Alright, so that was all the internal male genital organs that we needed to cover. We went through the testes and the ependymis, we went through the ductus deferens, the seminal glands and the ejaculatory ducts, we went through the prostate, the male urethra, and the bilbo-urethral glands. Let's now go through the external genital organs, which consists of the penis and the scrotum, and we will start with the penis. Similar to most things, it has external structures and internal structures. So let's go ahead and start with the external structures we'll see looking at the penis. So here's a lateral view of the penis, but to really be able to cover all external structures, we need to look at it from an inferior surface as well. So let's go ahead and do that. Essentially, the penis consists of three pipes, or three erectile bodies, that courses throughout its entire length. We have two corpora cavernosa penis, which are erectile bodies that erect the penis when engorged with blood, and one corpus spongiosum penis, which is the unpaired erectile body containing the urethra. So within the corpus spongiosum, that's where we have the spongy part of the male urethra. The penis can be divided as the root of the penis, which is the inner part covered by the skin and the muscles. We have the body of penis, which is the external movable part of the penis beneath the pubic symphysis. And we have the glans penis, which is the anterior end. Now, the root of the penis consists mainly of the bulb of penis, which is the dilated part of the corpus spongiosum underneath the perineum, and two crura of penis, which are the paired internal part of the corpus cavernosum. Now the body of penis is also composed of corpora cavernosa and the corpus spongiosum, but anatomically the body of penis has surfaces as well. It has a dorsum of penis, which is the anterior surface in a flaccid state in an anatomical position, and when erect it becomes the upper to posterior surface. It has a urethral surface, which is the surface facing the scrotum. Then we can see the fundiform ligament of the penis, which originates from the linea alba of the anterior abdominal wall, and make a loop around the penis, attaching the penis to the pubic symphysis. And we can also see the suspensory ligament of the penis, which attaches the dorsum of the penis to the anterior surface of the pubic symphysis. Now, there's one more structure that I want to mention in the body of penis, and that is, if you look at the penis from an inferior perspective, on the inferior side, there's going to be a line, or a ref, called the ref of penis. So, that was the body of penis. Now, let's do the glans penis. The glans penis is the most distal segment of the corpus spongiosum. It's also referred to as the head of penis. Similar to glans clitoris, the glans penis is the most sensitive erogenous zone and the primary anatomical source of male sexual pleasure due to the number of nerve endings. Alright, let's go ahead and zoom in and look at the structures. The proximal dilated part of the glans that faces the body of penis is called the corona of glans. It also has a neck, which is a groove that separates the glans from the body of penis. Around the glans penis, we can find the foreskin, or the preputes. The foreskin is a fold of skin that originates from the body of the penis and covers the glans. It can be pulled over the glans to a variable extent. Then we can find a frenulum, which is ventrally located. A frenulum is the transition between the skin of the glans and the skin of the prepuce. And lastly, we can also find some preputial glands, which are small smegma-producing glands at the inner margin of the foreskin. Smegma is a thick, white, uh, cheesy substance composed of dead skin and oil and other fluids that collect under the foreskin of the penis. It's more common in uncircumcised men who don't clean the area well enough. And women can also get smegma in their vaginal area as well. So that was the external surface of the penis. 
Let's now make a transverse cut like this, remove some part of the penis and look at it from this perspective. We will see this. This image illustrates the penis structures very well. We can see the corpus spongiosum down here, containing the urethra. We can see the corpora cavernosa. And around the corpora cavernosa, we can see the tunica albuginea, which is a dense layer of connective tissue that form a septum, called a septum penis, between the uh, corpora cavernosa. We can also see the deep fascia of the penis, which is a layer of connective tissue covering the erectile bodies. And we can see the superficial fascia of the penis, which enables free sliding of the skin. So it's located right underneath the skin. All right. Other structures we can see, which are very, very important, is the superficial dorsal vein of the penis. This is an unpaired vein that drains through the external pudendal veins into the common femoral vein. We also have the deep dorsal vein of the penis, which is an unpaired vein that bifurcates into the internal pudendal vein, which um, converges into the internal iliac vein. On the sides of it, we can see the dorsal artery of the penis, which supplies the skin and the glands of the penis and the foreskin. Then, within the corpora cavernosa, we can see the cavernous spaces and the trabecula of the corpora cavernosa. These are spaces that fill with venous blood during an erection. So, they are small cavities inside the erectile bodies, lined with endothelium. And in the middle, we can find the deep artery of the penis, which is inside the corpus cavernosum. And in the corpus spongiosum, we can see the urethral artery. So, that was everything I had for the penis. Now lastly, let's talk a little bit about the scrotum. The scrotum is a sac located outside of the body, right? So if you go ahead and look at the scrotum from this perspective, we will see this. So again, as we talked about earlier, the scrotum contains the testes and the ependymis, and also the ductus deferens on the posterior aspect. The temperature inside the scrotum is 2 to 4 degrees lower than the core body temperature, and this is to ensure the optimal spermatogenesis, because the optimal temperature for spermatogenesis is a little colder than our core temperature. If it gets too cold outside, the cremaster muscle contracts and pulls the scrotum upwards towards the perineum. Um, similar if it gets too hot, the cremaster muscle relaxes. Alright. So, the layers are as follows. First, we have the tunica vaginalis, which, remember, comes from the peritoneum. Then, externally to the internal spermatic fascia, we have a muscle, called the cremaster muscle, which consists of muscle bundles uh, from the internal oblique and the transversus abdominis muscle. And then, externally to this muscle, we have the external spermatic fascia, which is a continuation of the superficial abdominal fascia, and externally to this layer, we're going to have the dartos fascia. This is a 1-2 mm thick layer of connective tissue with elastic fibers and smooth muscles. And it's going to form a septum, or scrotal septum, which divides the scrotal pouch into two cavities for each testicle. Externally to the dartos fascia is the skin, as you see here. All of these layers form the scrotum. So, that was everything I had for the anatomy of the male gentle system. I really hope you found this video helpful. If you did, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. See you next time.